I'm going to get us started on Zoom. <clears throat> and uh, and you're looking at our title slide, Jim. Yep. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 31st edition of Chewbacca Chats. We're glad to have our audience back with us. And um, I want to say right up front, uh, thanks to Bar Harbor Bank and Trust for being the sponsor of this episode of Chewbacca Chats. We really appreciate their support. And we're really happy to have Professor James O'Toole, the uh, uh, Clove Millennium Chair in History at Boston College. Uh, Professor O'Toole is the author of The Faithful, A History of Catholics in America, and he spends part of every summer in Spruce Head, Maine, over on the, east, on the western shore of Penobscot Bay. And uh, Jim, welcome to this episode of Chewbacca Chats. Thanks very much. Pre pleasure to be here. Well, you've written an article for the 2019 issue of Chewbacca, one that focused on religious histories, and you happen to be an expert in the Catholic experience. And you went back to an episode in 1913 that connected the events 300 years earlier at uh, Saint Sauveur and looked at the uh, lessons that were drawn from that event 300 years previously. Would you? Um, would you begin by reading to us from your article? Sure. As spectacles go, this was not the grandest ever, but it was still a notable one in every respect, said one account. Solemn and inspiring, according to another. The participants had mostly arrived the day before and on the morning of Wednesday, August 6th, 1913, they assembled clad in the elaborate liturgical robes of the Roman Catholic Church. They had come to dedicate a new parish church building. And as a crowd of about a thousand looked on, they began by walking around it in a procession reciting the prescribed prayers, an account said, whereby the material edifice is dedicated and sanctified for divine services. Next, they went inside for a solemn mass during which one of the prelates preached for nearly an hour on a text from 1 Corinthians, God it is that giveth the increase. The mass concluded, a formal banquet began in a nearby hotel featuring toasts, speeches, and accompanying music. Though the audience was already well fatigued with the long exercises, one observer commented, yet they listened most attentively. Then it was back to the church for a service of Vespers with a shorter but still substantial sermon. And by the time everything ended around 10 o'clock that night, the impressive exercises had been deemed an unalloyed success. And that's a description of the dedication of the Holy Redeemer Church building um, on Mount Desert Street in uh, Mount Desert. And its uh, facade is recognizable to anybody who's uh, been to Bar Harbor, and it's the personages in, uh, gathered in front that make it such, this such an impressive photograph. And um, so there one purpose was to dedicate this new church, and then there was a, another side of it, too. Can you tell us uh, the other reason this ceremony was held? That's right. This church uh, in Bar Harbor had been under construction for several years and was completed in 1910, but it hadn't yet been formally dedicated. Uh, and the uh, Bishop of Portland, Maine, um, chose this occasion in August of 1913 to do that dedication because he also wanted to make a larger point about the presence of Catholics in what became the state of Maine. He um, uh, identified uh, an earlier, the earlier settlement 
Saint Sauveur on, on Mount Desert um, 300 years before. And he wanted to use the dedication of this parish church building to celebrate 300 years, 1613 to 1913, 300 years of Catholic history in Maine. But there was also, uh, in addition to, to that, there was, and we'll, we'll get into it, but there was quite a um, present day purpose for, for this, a message to be delivered. But um, how, did he, um, how did he make the linkage between the significance of that event, 300 years, the Saint Sauveur settlement, and what was going on in the present in 1913? What was the linkage between those two events? Right. This was not a celebration of history just for its own sake. Uh, the bishop, Bishop Walsh, wanted to make a point not only about history, but also about the present. The Catholic community in Maine was still relatively small. Maybe about 15% of the population of Maine were Catholics uh, at the time. This is just at the time of the First World War. Um, and so Bishop Walsh wanted to make a statement about them uh, and the present as well as the, as the past. Catholics tended to be on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladders. Uh, and they had, even until fairly recent times, been subject to hostility. Um, Anti-Catholic sentiment, people who looked down on them because they were poorer uh, than the rest of the population and so on. And so what Bishop Walsh wanted to do by celebrating this 300 years of history um, was say, in effect, Catholics are here too. They're part of the community and they've been a part of the community for a long period of time. Um, so uh, in effect, don't, don't look down on Catholics just because they're not at the top of the social pile. They have a long history uh, in uh, Maine as well and uh, as much of a right in a sense to be there and to be a part of the Maine, larger Maine community um, as anybody else. So in a way he was kind of answering a climate that was somewhat opposed to Catholics or oppressive of, of Catholics. We're not too far removed from the rising of the Ku Klux Klan uh, following the release of the film um, uh, to, to Make Birth a Nation. Of a nation. Birth, Birth of a, of a nation. nation, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's right. That was the, that was the um, a part of the climate. And in the 19 teens and 20s, the Ku Klux Klan, especially uh, here in New England, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was as much an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant uh, organization as it was an anti-Black organization. Uh, that wasn't true in other parts of the country, obviously, but that was a part of the, part of the climate uh, that uh, Walsh was trying to counter uh, here. A couple of years uh, before, a member of the Maine State Legislature had introduced a so-called convent inspection bill. Um, he was sure that nefarious things were going on inside uh, the convents of Catholic sisters, and he wanted <clears throat> to pass a law that would make it um, possible for um, officials of the state to go inside and see what was going on. The bill didn't pass, uh, but that too was a part of the general um, climate uh, of suspicion of Catholics and hostility toward Catholics that Walsh was trying to, to counter again by saying, no, Catholics have been in Maine for 300 years. There's nothing um, uh, wrong with them. There's nothing unpatriotic about them. Yeah, and it, uh, very, uh, conspiracy theories uh, really <laughs> had a way of setting the tone, right? The, the thing about what was going on in, in convents and other areas, they really tended to um, take their place in culture. I know we have a, a, a manuscript that outlines a conspiracy theory in our in our collection at the historical society that's right that's right <clears throat> so this was organized this was not just a local event this was organized at a at a very high level and here's a image of some of the people who put it together can you tell us how this was in, engaged the uh, senior leadership of the catholic church yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, seated there on the right, that's Bishop Lewis Walsh, who was the fourth man to be the Bishop of Portland, Maine. Um, he had been appointed in 1906. So in 1913, he's still relatively new uh, at, at his job. Walsh was a native of Salem, Massachusetts. 
uh, had been educated as a priest uh, in Canada and France and Rome, uh, and he came back to, uh, to New England, uh, where he taught at a seminary in Boston, and then was the first superintendent of the Catholic school system uh, in Boston. So I think that background, among other things, uh, made him always interested in teaching, uh, and the events that he uh, planned uh, for Bar Harbor were had a, a real educational purpose uh, to them, I think. Um, uh, and so Walsh, uh, again, fairly new in his job, wanted to arrange this ceremony to mark 300 years of Catholicism in, in Maine. And he started planning several years uh, before um, he, um, uh, so that he could attract Catholic leaders from around the country and even, even from around the world. Uh, the other man seated here uh, on, on the left uh, is a man named Giovanni Bonzano who was uh, the representative of the Pope uh, on the, these occasions. So again, as, as you say, it wasn't just a local celebration, even a representative from the Pope came uh, and, uh, and served um, to, to make the event a, a special one. Uh, Bonzano was what was called the apostolic delegate to the United States. The United States and the Vatican didn't have formal diplomatic relations at the time, but in effect, that's what, that's what Bonzano was. So if Walsh is trying to make a, a statement, a larger statement about uh, the um, uh, nature of the Catholic Church and the, uh, the history of it and the respectability of it even, um, having a representative of the Pope come to Bar Harbor, Maine was a way of making that statement. And the other uh, men you see here were the other Catholic bishops from around New England. And um, I don't know if this is, um how this pertains, Jim, but I, I think this is an old Catholic church. This is pre-Vatican II. And I wonder if that gave it a different, the gathering and the people involved a different cast to the, to the whole event than we might react to it if we were to saw, see something similar today. Very much so. This would have been a much more elaborate ritual uh, than a similar ritual of dedicating a parish church would be today. Um, you know, the uh, religious purpose would still be the same to officially uh, make this a, a Catholic parish, but, but the, uh, the ceremonies at the time, well, among other things, the ceremonies at the time would have been conducted entirely in Latin. Um, so all the people who gathered uh, wouldn't necessarily have been able to follow what was being said. Um, but the, uh, the ritual, the, the robes and vestments that they wore uh, would all have been much more elaborate than anything we'd see today. And, and that too, I think, had a, had a purpose of um, saying, well, uh, this, this, even this little parish church in the little corner of Maine um, is a part of this larger worldwide culture of, uh, of Catholicism. And uh, maybe the, the different tone and uh, expectations explain the patience that people had to sit in those pews for so long. <laughs> That's right. For this ceremony, hours and hours. <laughs> The, some minds probably wandered during the ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to invite our audience to uh, pose questions. If you're watching on Zoom, use the chat or the Q&A function. If you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, just go ahead and put a comment and we'll try to uh, make sure that we address uh, your questions and comments. So uh, Walsh had the idea that history could serve the needs of his congregation and his overall purpose. Can you tell us how that, how that worked? Yes, I, I think uh, because he had these larger purposes in mind uh, and was himself personally interested in history, as well as being a, a former teacher, I think he designed this occasion um, uh, so that it could establish the long-standing traditions of uh, Catholics in Maine. And there were actually several possibilities that he could have chosen, could have chosen, uh, for, uh, to accomplish uh, that purpose. There were other historical anniversaries around this same time, and he could have made something of, of all of them. One of them uh, was... Um, uh, when he came to Maine, he was only a couple of years shy of the 100th anniversary of the building of St. Patrick's Church 
uh, just outside Damariscata. St. Patrick's, which is still an active church today, um, is the oldest Catholic church building in New England. And so if Bishop Walsh was looking for a historical event to celebrate, he could have chosen that 100th anniversary uh, of the church in Damariscata. The problem was uh, the, uh, that anniversary uh, was going to occur only about a year and a half after he arrived in Maine, and he just didn't have time to plan this uh, same kind of grand uh, celebration. Uh, he did go on the anniversary of the of St. Patrick's, uh, but um, he didn't have enough lead time to to turn that event uh, into a, a greater um, uh, celebration. He could also have chosen a couple of dates in the 1920s uh, relating to Father Sebastian Rao, uh, an early Jesuit missionary uh, to Maine. Um, uh, there were, were a couple of uh, bicentennials connected with Rao, uh, but those uh, events would all have been in the 1920s. Too far away, I think, uh, for Bishop Walsh to uh, make uh, anything of them. He wanted to do something sooner rather than later. So it really, it really was uh, a perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> Three that, that's right. And, and, uh -huh. and the other thing is that, of course, there was another um, 300th anniversary uh, at St. Croix on uh, Passamaquoddy Bay. But the 300th anniversary of that had already happened, had already come and gone before Walsh came to Maine. Uh, there was a small uh, French missionary settlement there. Um, and uh, so that anniversary had passed, making uh, the one in Bar Harbor the one that Walsh focused on. And he had a lot of material to draw from. All the, the episodes that you just recited, so many of them are documented in the Jesuit relations, which is a Right. fundamental document for uh, North American historians and for the history of the Catholic Church. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, other historians have, have relied on, on those uh, Jesuit uh, relations. Um, the most famous uh, probably um, um, uh, was used to um, uh, Francis Parkman. Um, uh, was uh, used those Jesuit relations, and it was he who identified the what he thought was the site uh, of Saint Sauveur on on um, on the island. Right. Well, tell here we're showing an image of Reverend James O'Brien, who for many many years was the parish priest for First Saint Sylvia's that preceded the Holy Redeemer Church, and then for the uh, Holy Redeemer Church itself. And so he watched over a flock, an immigrant flock in Bar Harbor. What was the Catholic presence in Bar Harbor like in 1913? Uh, the, the Catholic presence in, uh, in Bar Harbor was, uh, was very small, but uh, perhaps like today, uh, it was small during the year, but grew to uh, several times over in the summer. Uh, as as people uh, as people came for the for the summer, initially what Catholics there were on the island this is, would be in the 1880s and 90s, um, maybe about three or four hundred families, uh, all three or four hundred people I should say, uh, all together. And initially priests came over from Ellsworth uh, and would say mass and and would then go back to uh, Ellsworth, uh, but when Saint um, Sylvia's church was built on um, Kibo Street, uh, then a, a priest could be assigned to it permanently. Uh, and after an earlier um, a priest, uh, Father O'Brien here came in 1894 uh, and served for 30 years. So he was a prominent local figure and a well-liked local figure. Yeah, and I, as I mentioned before to you, Jim, before this started, when the day he died in 1924, every business in town closed down for his funeral. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. widely respected. And uh, so it sounds like um, the history that Walsh was drawing from, he, he had some selections, to, he had some selections, to <laughs> some specific episodes he wanted to counter, especially episodes of discrimination. So in 1913, uh, it was only 60 so years 
previously that John Baptist had right. been tarred and feathered. That's like us thinking back to an event that happened in 1960, which right. doesn't seem too far-fetched. Seems with, right. within a lifetime of memory. Can you tell, would, us, tell about the discrimination and what he wanted to counter? Yeah, the the John Baptist incident, incident uh, is was the was the most prominent one. And as you say, there would still have been people alive in 1913 who remembered it, or uh, at least had heard their parents uh, talk about it. John Baptist was a Jesuit missionary from Switzerland originally. Uh, who came um, to the United States and um, uh, served uh, native Catholic populations uh, in Maine. Um, and uh, while he was in uh, the town of Ellsworth in 1854, uh, there was an upsurge of, of anti-Catholic uh, sentiment um, and the mob seized Father, Father Baptist uh, one evening, um, stripped him of his clothes, mounted him on a sharp rail, and tarred and feathered him and uh, paraded him around town uh, uh, as a way of uh, expressing their hostility, to say the least. Uh, of of the church, Babst was a uh, was a tough customer, however, and um, uh, always proudly said thereafter uh, that uh, the day after the tar and feathering, which was on a Saturday, uh, the day after he said mass uh, for the Catholics of Ellsworth, nonetheless, that's a measure. As we look at this now, that's a measure of the conflict between the various groups. And as I've said, there would have been people, uh, could have been people at the celebration in 1913 who remembered uh, that Father Baptist incident. And um, there was a uh, convenience in asserting the legitimacy of Catholic presence on Mount Desert Island in that uh, while Walsh was pointing to a 300 year old tradition, the P Plymouth landing occurred only 293 years previously. Right, yeah. Walsh never said it in so many words, but as I studied this, I formed the conclusion that he had this very much in mind. Um, if, uh, as he saw it, Catholics were looked down upon by the Yankee uh, community in New England genuinely, generally, um, that looked to the landing at Plymouth Rock in 1620, Walsh could say uh, by indirection, uh, but nonetheless clearly, oh, 1620, uh, Catholics were already here by 1613. Uh, those, those pilgrims are, are newcomers. And in fact, in Walsh's sermon, he even uh, tried to reach even farther back. He said he thought it was possible that one day um, research would show that uh, Christian Vikings uh, had come to, uh, to Mount Desert, uh, maybe even in the eighth century. And perhaps even St. Brendan, the legendary Irish uh, explorer had been there in the sixth century. So uh, his, as I say, his subtle unstated but pointed message uh, to anybody in the 20th century who was inclined to look down on Catholics uh, would be, you're the newcomers. Uh, Catholics are the ones who've been here all along. Yeah, yeah. So um, how did he hope that this um, assertion of Catholic uh, legitimacy would switch the public, in, uh, would make an, have an influence on the public interest? Yeah, the, the, the Catholic community, as I've said, was small, but it was growing, and it was beginning to uh, assert itself in politics and social life. Um, Catholics uh, in Maine were an increasing voting bloc, um, and uh, the marshalling of forces that, um, that Walsh um, put together uh, for this celebration, again, made a subtle point in, in that way as well. That's most clearly uh, seen, I think, in a second celebration of the 300th anniversary. Uh, that was held uh, not in Bar Harbor, but in Portland uh, later that fall, on Columbus Day, in fact, uh, a so-called civic ceremony of 300 years of Catholicism in Maine. A civic ceremony was held in the Portland City Hall uh, in October of 1913. Um, and both the mayor and the governor 
uh, came to that uh, celebration and made appropriate speeches about the importance of the church in Maine um, with thanks for the work that Walsh had done uh, and so on. So Catholics were beginning to assert themselves uh, politically. Now, I think it, it took a while. I haven't checked this unless I'm wrong. I think maybe it was Ed Muskie who was the first Catholic governor of Maine. I could I stand to be corrected on on that. So this assertion of Catholic political power maybe have might have taken uh, a long time, but um, Walsh wanted to make that point uh, as as well. And let's take a closer look at this uh, image. We want to show our audience uh, this really amazing photograph. And the first thing that's striking to me is the presence of these Penobscot and Passamaquoddy people right here that. And, and can you just kind of take us through this photograph and what we're looking at here and what, what's implied in the presence of these people? Sure. The, the prominent place in this photograph of the, of the Native peoples was, was quite deliberate. Um, um, mission, Catholic missionaries from Canada had first come into Maine uh, in, the, in the 1600s, uh, and they uh, converted um, communities of, of people uh, around Old Town, around Pleasant Point, um, some in around uh, Arno. Um, and uh, it's interesting, these missionaries converted Native peoples to Catholicism. And then it was maybe a couple of hundred years before those Catholic converts saw a priest again after the missionary moved on. Uh, and yet they maintained their, their Catholic identity. It was to help them that Father Baptist had come uh, into, the, into the state in 1854. And so they were a, a very important part of the, of the Catholic community uh, in Maine, uh, older and maybe even more important, you might say, than immigrants from Ireland uh, and French Canada um, and, uh, and other parts of the world as well. So the fact uh, that they were included in this ceremony and, and uh, given such a prominent place, as you see in this, uh, in this photograph, is, is an indication of, uh, is an acknowledgement of the role that they had played uh, in, the, in the community. Other than that, Catholics in Maine tended to be uh, working class folks, again, as I've said, from, from Ireland, from French Canada, other parts of, of Europe as, as well. Catholicism, um, such as it was in Maine uh, in 1913, was concentrated largely in cities. Portland, Biddeford, Lewiston, places like that, uh, with then scattered communities uh, elsewhere. So again, it was that um, up and coming uh, nature of the Catholic population that Walsh wanted to encourage uh, and promote in this celebration. And we have a question from our audience. Sam Younger asked, did this event have any connection with Louise Drexel Morrill, her husband, Colonel Morrill, and or her sister, St. Catherine Drexel. Absolutely, absolutely. Probably uh, the most uh, prominent Catholic layman uh, in Bar Harbor at the time uh, was uh, Colonel Morrill. Um, and in fact, the various uh, dignitaries, uh, the apostolic delegate and the other bishops, they stayed uh, at, uh, at, at the Morrell House. Um, that photograph you saw of them together was all on, on the uh, porch uh, of the, uh, the Morrell House. Um, and uh, so he was, a, he was a very prominent uh, uh, figure in, um, in uh, Bar Harbor. And uh, as, as the questioner uh, indicated, uh, originally from Philadelphia, he had married into the Drexel family um, and was a sister-in-law of Catherine Drexel, now Saint Catherine Drexel, uh, who was a, um, a, a woman who farmed a who formed a, um, a community of Catholic sisters to work particularly with African Americans uh, and with uh, Native Americans. In fact, also, I should say, uh, Morell also uh, donated the land right next to Holy Redeemer Church here, just down the street, uh, for the convent of sisters um, that uh, staffed this St. Edward's School, which was associated with, with the parish. Um, and uh, the school was named at, uh, St. Edward's in, in honor and in thanks uh, for Edward Morell. 
and the uh, that convent until very recently housed the Bar Harbor Historical Society. So that's right. I, I visited there a couple of summers ago and and uh, uh, saw the house, and I, I had heard that it was the house was for sale. I, I don't know if it has it been sold since. You know, I don't know its sales status, but the Bar Harbor Historical Society is very much uh, relocated in La Rochelle, a beautiful uh, building over on West Street. Uh huh. Okay, good. Well, um, we have um, uh, just a couple of, couple of slides left. We want to make sure that we cover what Walsh had to say in his sermon. Uh, not his version of it, but a shorter version of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he, um, uh, yes, uh, it'll be a shorter version. I won't go the, the full uh, hour and a quarter, hour and a half that, uh, that he used. Um, uh, he reviewed the, the history, not just of uh, the community on, on uh, the island, but the entire history of, uh, of Catholics uh, in Maine, including the, uh, though, obviously, the, the St. Silver uh, settlement. Um, which was um, old, undoubtedly that, but it, in fact, the settlement that he was celebrating was very short-lived. Um, a small group of um, French uh, um, military men and settlers and two priests uh, landed uh, on the island in May of 1613. Um, and the, the site is generally uh, thought to be uh, at Fernals Point uh, on, on Somme Sound. Uh, they landed in, in um, um, May uh, of that year and began to build a settlement. Uh, there aren't direct records, but mass was undoubtedly said by, uh, by the two priests who were with them, Fathers Bayard and Massé. Um, and the intention was that this would be a, a long-standing uh, settlement. rather. But in the fall, in early September, a fleet of English um, uh, came up from Virginia. Uh, of course, the English claimed this territory as, as well as the French. Um, the English uh, destroyed the settlement. They took uh, the priests um, uh, captive. Uh, and so this settlement that had begun um, uh, with such hopes in May of that year uh, was gone uh, by September uh, of, the, of that year. And in fact, Catholics hadn't really come back to Maine after that uh, for a couple of hundred years. Even so, uh, Walsh uh, glossed over that a little bit. He even called the settlement a permanent settlement. Well, the intention had been that it would be permanent, uh, but it, it turned out to be somewhat less so. And nonetheless, from his perspective, uh, marked a 300th anniversary. And we've been showing you, by the way, uh, the gorgeous images uh, by Jennifer Steen Boer, her photographs of stained glass. That was a feature of this issue of the magazine. That, and these are from both uh, Holy Redeemer Church and also St. Ignatius Loyola in, uh, in Northeast Harbor. So uh, you say in your conclusion, Jim, uh, that uh, Walsh used, quote, the past to say something significant about the present. How did, how did he do that? Yeah, it, it would, he, he was interested in these larger messages that the historical celebration could, um, could provide. Um, you know, I think uh, we do that with history all the time. Um, the 400th anniversary of the landing of the, of the pilgrims. Um, uh, just yesterday, in fact, uh, was the 400th anniversary of the signing of the Mayflower Compact, the first document of self-government in America. Well, that's that event is celebrated today, not just a, for a historical event, but also as a reminder of the importance of self-government and democracy and participation today. Walsh was doing the same thing, I think, with this, with this celebration um, in Bar Harbor uh, in, in 1913. Yes, there is this history. Uh, yes, it establishes the Catholic community as, a, as a, an important part of the larger uh, main community. So uh, everybody uh, should, should look on that history uh, as uh, as contributing to the larger history of the community. 
Well, I think we, uh, we've continued to do that in our own world this year. This is the bicentennial of Maine statehood right. Right. compared it to the centennial of Maine statehood and noted how different the stories that we tell then and now have become and how uh, much we link them to current events. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think we can get away from it. I think that's right. You know, some people uh, look on history as being irrelevant. It's past after all, it's over. Uh, what's, what's the meaning for that? Obviously, as a historian, I believe just the opposite. Um, history doesn't always have clear, direct, obvious to everybody lessons. Um, but I think if we don't um, understand our history, if we don't study it, um, then we're, we're less than, than we might be. History for a larger community, I think, is like memory for an individual person. Um, and, and I think um, in these celebrations in 1913, Bishop Walsh was trying to enhance the memory, uh, not just of Catholics, but of all the people in Maine. Well, if anyone in our audience has uh, uh, other questions for us, please uh, put them in the chat section of Zoom or in the comments of Facebook, we'd be happy to field them. And if you uh, don't come up with a question until after we're over, we'll reply on our Facebook live page. Um, well, I'm not, not seeing anything immediately. Uh, uh, Professor James O'Toole, Department of History at Boston College, it's been a pleasure having you uh, back to talk to us again. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. It's been a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to being uh, back uh, on the island uh, this summer. Yes, and uh, we'll have to line you up for another article one of these days. We're always trying <laughs> to rope in uh, good writers. Good. Happy uh, to do it. Well, well, thanks. It's been uh, really great talking to you, Tim. Thank you. To our audience, uh, I invite you back next week. I will be talking about uh, George Heflin's silent mission. It's a story of how a mysterious inscription at Seawall was uh, deciphered using a lot of resources when, within the community and how it tied us to an individual who turned out to be very, very significant in the lives of people in New England. So I, I hope you'll join us again next Thursday at 4.30. Uh, but for now, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, take care, everyone. And Jim, once again, thank you. Thank you.